we've been doing this series, Disturbing Divine Behavior, and the reason we've had this focus for, for these opening talks for, um, at least recently, is because of how many passages of Scripture, again, that once you get past a devotional reading of the Bible, and you get into an in-depth and even maybe a chronological reading of the Bible, you can run into some passages that make you go, what in the world, <laughs> what in the world is going on here? Uh, God sometimes comes across as cruel, and this has been fodder for a number of atheists, whereby instead of saying, I, I don't want you to read the Bible because it's a bunch of myths, instead they're encouraging now for people to read the Bible and say, and once you read the Bible, it would give you good reasons for rejecting what the Bible has to say. It's a little bit of a different move, right? Uh, and so the passage that I'm going to be dealing with tonight is in Judges chapter 19. And I'm going to read it because we need to, we need to keep the whole narrative together. So it's going to take me a little bit to read it for you. Uh, but this is probably the most disturbing passage that, that I've come across in all of the Bible. Um, aside from when you think about the crucifixion of Jesus. So, you know, Jesus is kind of always the exception when you say something like that. But, but what I would also encourage you to do is to um, read Judges 19, 20, and 21 all together. We don't have time to do that. And instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to unpack some themes from the 20th chapter and the 21st chapter so that maybe we can see what it is that God is doing in this passage. I also want to say that, you know, this passage, it's not just... It's not just kind of disturbing, it's unusually disturbing. Uh, somebody was sharing with me this morning after church, they said, you know, I know the, I know the passage that you're talking about, and uh, man, I can't really believe that you're going there. <laughs> I said, well, it's in the Bible, and since it's in the Bible, I think we would do well uh, to, to see what it is that God is doing. And so, how about I just jump into Judges chapter 19 and see what we can do with it. Here's the way that it goes. It says, in those days... When there was no king in Israel, a Levite staying in a remote part of the hill country of Ephraim acquired a woman from Bethlehem in Judah as his concubine. But she was unfaithful to him and left him for her father's house in Bethlehem in Judah. She was there for four months. Then her husband got up and followed her to speak kindly to her and bring her back. He had his servant with him and a pair of donkeys. So she brought him to her father's house. And when the girl's father saw him, he gladly welcomed him. His father-in-law, the girl's father, detained him, and he stayed with him for three days. They ate, they drank, they spent the nights there. And on the fourth day, they got up early in the morning, prepared to go, but the girl's father said to his son-in-law, have something to eat and keep up your strength, and then you can go. So they sat down, and the two of them ate and drank together, and then the girl's father said to the man, please agree to stay overnight and enjoy yourself. The man got up to go, but his father-in-law persuaded him, so he stayed and spent the night there again. He got up early in the morning of the fifth day to leave, but the girl's father said to him, please stay, please keep up your strength. So they waited until the afternoon, and the two of them ate, and the man got up to go with his concubine and his servant. When, the, when his father-in-law, the girl's father, said to him, look, the night is coming, please spend the night. See, the day is almost over. Spend the night here, enjoy yourself, and then you can get up early tomorrow for your journey and go home. But the man was unwilling to spend the night. He got up, he departed, and he arrived opposite Jebus, that is Jerusalem. Uh, the man had his uh, two saddled donkeys and his concubine with him. And when they were near Jebus and the day was almost gone, the servant said to his master, Master, please, why not let us stop at this Jebusite city and spend the night here? But his master replied to him, We will not stop at a foreign city where there are no Israelites. Let's move to Gibeah. Come on, he said. Let's try to reach one of the places and spend the night in Gibeah or Ramah. So they continued on their journey. And then the sun set as they neared Gibeah in Benjamin. They stopped to go in and spend the night in Gibeah. The Levite went in and sat down in the city square, but no one took them into their home to spend the night. Which, by the way, is supposed to be a statement against the lack of hospitality for this community, just so you know. In the evening, an old man came in from his work in the field. He was from the hill country of Ephraim, but he was residing in Gibeah where the people were Benjamites, Benjaminites. And when he looked up and saw the traveler in the city square, the old man asked, where are you going and where do you come from? And he answered him, we're traveling from Bethlehem and Judah to the remote hill country of Ephraim where I'm from. I went to Bethlehem and Judah and now I'm going to the house of the Lord. No one has taken me into his home. 
Although there's straw and feed for the donkeys and I have bread and wine for me, my concubine and the servant with us, there's nothing that we lack. Welcome, said the old man. I'll take care of everything you need. Only don't spend the night in the square. So he brought him to his house and fed the donkeys. And then they washed their feet, they ate and they drank. And while they were enjoying themselves, all of a sudden, wicked men of the city surrounded the house and they beat on the door. And they said to the old man who was the owner of the house, bring out the man who came to your house so that we can have sex with him. The owner of the house went out and said to them, please don't do this evil, my brothers. After all, this man has come to my house. Don't commit this horrible outrage. Here, let me bring out my virgin daughter and the man's concubine now. Abuse them. Do whatever you want to them, but don't commit this outrageous thing against this man. But the men would not listen to him. So the man seized his concubine and took her outside to them and they raped her and they abused her all night until the morning. At daybreak, they let her go. Early that morning, the woman made her way back and as it was getting light, she collapsed at the doorway of the man's house where her master was. And when her master got up in the morning, opened the doors of the house and went out to leave on his journey, there was the woman his concubine, collapsed near the doorway of the house with her hands on the threshold. Get up, he told her, let's go. But there was no response. So the man put her on his donkey and he set out for home. And when he entered his house, he picked up a knife, took hold of his concubine, cut her into 12 pieces, limb by limb, then sent her throughout the territory of Israel. Everyone who saw it said, nothing like this has ever happened or has been seen since the day the Israelites came out of the land of Egypt until now. Think it over, discuss it, and speak up. Well, that's not exactly the Sunday night pick-me-up, is it? Uh, but we're dealing with the rape of the concubine. Uh, this passage is one that, at least for me, has given me uh, probably... It, it, <laughs> It's, it's one of the passages that I've struggled with the most. And when you just read it, I think on the face of it, you can go, I get it. I get why you struggle. Um, it also harkens back to some other things that you see in scripture before. Earlier in the Disturbing Divine Behavior series, we saw what seemed to be very similar uh, because you have the story of Lot and his daughters. And as you read that narrative, you think, Ooh, this, this, sounds, this sounds eerily similar to what happened there. For those of you that weren't here, let me just kind of fill you in on that. Uh, because you have in that story back in uh, uh, Genesis, you have two what are messengers of God uh, that are taking up uh, residence in Lot's home. And much like what you just read in Judges chapter 19, you have people from the city, they come and they surround the home and they say, the two men that are with you, send them out to us so that we can have sex with them. Now, basically, and a number of Old Testament scholars will try to make a lot of this idea where what they're trying to do is, as you have someone that's coming in that is a foreigner, uh, one of the ways to more or less put them under your foot, one of the ways to let them know who it is that is in power is to do that to them. Uh, and so you see what is similar in the Lot story because Lot is saying, please don't do this because he's trying to be hospitable. And Lot's response was, instead of sending the men out, I'm going to send my two virgin daughters out. And as he says, you do whatever you want with them. Now, this is why people struggle as they, as they read the Bible. Because on the one hand, you're saying, well, the Bible, all scripture is God breathed. It is profitable for reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness that the person of God might be mature and thoroughly furnished for every good work. And then you read these passages and you go, what in the world, <laughs> right? There were a couple of things to keep in mind with the story of Lot. And if you want to, you can go back. And if you just go to Veritas at Woodridge, you can watch the whole talk and hopefully it will help you. But Lot is held up as a negative example. In the whole narrative, Lot is held up as a negative example. 
And the other thing that we see in the story is that uh, regarding his daughters, I mean, thank God that you have the two messengers, the angelic messengers that are there because they step out and they confront the people of the city and their wickedness. And they're the ones that render divine judgment on them for what it is that they were asking Lot to provide for them. So even though you don't have that verse that says, uh, you know, and uh, by the way, this is wrong. What you do see is that God still judges the people for the evil that is, that is in them. So this brings us, because I think if you're reading Judges 19 and you were here earlier and you saw the, the story of Lot and his daughters, that probably popped into your head and it should have. But here in Judges 19, it's the disturbing account of the rape and the dissection. She's not just raped, she's dissected of the Levite's concubine. Uh, Phyllis Tribble, who has, uh, has reflected on this passage, said of all the characters in scripture, this woman is the most sinned against. I always kind of hold out the Jesus thing. But nevertheless, I don't think anybody could read this passage and walk away. If it doesn't touch your heart, something's going on in your heart. I have a hard time just reading it. David Lamb, who is an Old Testament scholar, says this. There's another, another troubling aspect to this passage. There's no clear verse that says, for example, gang rape is wrong. And he says, and wouldn't it be nice if that were just clearly in there, right? As this is happening, and in verse 17, by the way, gang rape is wrong. He said, and that's what people struggle with. So, even though there's no clear verse that says gang rape is wrong, like their deeds were evil in the sight of the Lord, I think that there's some things that we can see in this passage that show you what God is really thinking. Uh, so with lessons about male violence against women, I think one of the things that we can look at is a passage like this and say God's voice is to be heard and God isn't silent regarding this. And the other thing is this, one of the things you find in scripture in comparison to the communities around them in the ancient Near East, you're going to find that God has a very high view of women, that women are created in the image of God, equally valuable to men, are sacred in his eyes, and nothing like this should have ever happened. So this story, and this is the first thing I would invite you to remember, this story is descriptive, it's not prescriptive. This story is descriptive, it is not prescriptive. It's describing something that happened. It's not prescribing a course of action for men in the way that they're supposed to view or act toward women. Think about it, the story is set during the time of the judges. And the way that this even began, there's very little government happening here. The first and last verses remind us that there was no king. And I mean, if you look at chapter 19, verse one, there is no king. And as I said to you before, we don't have time to read chapters 19, 20, and 21 tonight. I'd still be reading. But if you look at Judges chapter 21, verse 25, guess what? It reminds us that there is no king, which has already become a motif, this theme that goes throughout Judges. And the result of this is everyone is doing what is right in their own eyes. This also comes at a climactic point of the Bible's goriest story. Other books uh, relate more deaths, but Judges with Adonai Bezek's thumbs and toes being cut off, Eglon, who is described as being incredibly fat. By the way, uh, I did a series on Judges here not too long ago. I I likened Eglon to Jabba the Hutt, uh, but this guy was so fat that when he is stabbed, it literally swallows the sword, that's fat. Uh, Sisera, by the way, you might remember the story of Jael. Jael, who is the female hero, one of the female heroes of Judges. And Sisera, this evil guy, and she tent pegs his temple. And I don't mean a little bit, she pegs his head all the way into the ground. She was on it. Uh, Abimelech's skull gets crushed. Samson's eyes get gouged out. And then you have the concubine dissected. This depicts more body damage than like the whole Bible, the rest of the Bible combined. It's a lot. The story is the final climax in this book. So it's important. And it's arguably no coincidence, and I'm just quoting Peter Williams here, it's arguably no coincidence that the Bible, which rigorously depicts human wrong, records both small government, which is judges. When I say small, it's like non-existent, right? I mean, that's pretty small. Small government and big government, if you look at the books of Kings, First and Second Kings, as unraveling in the tragedy of male sexual violence. And the result of what happens because of male sexual violence against women, you find, is civil war. 
everything literally starts to fall apart. And it's not from the outside, it's from the inside. They just collapse in on themselves. So neither decentralized nor centralized government, nor even a great constitution, by the way, can restrain human evil. This is one of the things that we have to see that you see both in Judges and you see in the books of Kings. So God, instead, government isn't going to get the job done. So what is going to get the job done? And the answer is God is going to have to come into the world to sort things out personally. That's what's going to get the job done. So the account begins in 19.1. The Levite takes the concubine. Um, a concubine, just so you know, is a second tier wife. All of you are probably sitting here thinking about Solomon, aren't you? And you're thinking about a thousand women, right? Wives and concubines. A concubine is a second tier wife. But this guy doesn't even have a first tier wife. So he's kind of using her from the start. Um, note, by the way, she is from Bethlehem, just like David. She is from Bethlehem, just like Jesus. In this story, it's no coincidence that the main victim comes from Bethlehem, which is the town of King David. And the main bad guys come from Gibeah, which, by the way, is the town of King Saul. Just saying. Both final stories in Judges, if you look at chapters 17 and 18, and then you, as I said, go ahead and read 19 through 21, contain a Levite. It talks about Ephraim and talks about Bethlehem. If, as in some ordering of the Bible, you put Ruth after Judges, you have three stories about Bethlehem in a row. You think Bethlehem is important? It just keeps coming up. The concubine is unfaithful to her man. You saw this in chapter 19, verse 2. But it doesn't seem to consist of going off with someone else so much as if she just went home. She went back to Bethlehem. She's there for four months, during which the guy seems to do nothing at all about her. Nothing, at least, that we can tell from the text. Four months recurs later, and that's in chapter 20, verse, uh, I think, 47. Eventually, the Levite goes to Bethlehem to find her. So what's so striking is how warmly his father-in-law receives him. Did you notice that? They lodge, they drink together. Her father repeatedly delays his departure. I don't know about you, but I'm sitting there reading that story going, this is a little weird to me, right? I'd be like, hey, there's the door. You know, help yourself. The men have camaraderie with which the Levite doesn't share with his concubine. Later on, you see a bond between the Levite and another male host, which overrides their concern for women, like all together. And after days of delay and more merriment, you also saw the drinking. No, come back. Let's do this more. After delay and more merriment with his father-in-law, the Levite sets off with his concubine and male servant. But too late in the day for safe travel. And as it gets dark, the servant advises they go to a Canaanite city. That was chapter 19, verse 11, which resonates uh, with when later Saul's uh, servant advises him to go to Ramah. Now hold on to all of this. The Levite wants to press on to an Israelite city like Gibeah. And they get to Gibeah, the tribe of Benjamin, after dark. And guess what? Nobody, nobody says howdy. Nobody welcomes them. They're bad Aggies. I'm an Aggie, so they're bad Aggies. And then an old man from out of town, from the tribe of Ephraim, says, come on in. We like him. Did you notice that? I mean, on the front end of this, it's like, hey, this is the one guy that's like, no, please come into the house. He's like an ideal host. He's like, I'll even feed the donkeys. I mean, how good can you get it, right? They're having a great time together. And that's when the men of the city start banging on the door. Careful readers will have already noticed some echoes, as I pointed out before, of, of the Sodom narrative in Genesis 19 to Judges 19. That's the story of Lot and his daughters. But here's what I want to connect. In both, the locals don't offer hospitality. Did you notice that? There's mention of the city square. Someone from out of town hosts. Even the phrase, he pressed upon him in Judges 19.8 is rare enough to remind us of how the men of Sodom pressed in on Lot. Same word. But now the echoes, and I just want to quote Peter Williams here because I think he says it really well. He said, the echoes become unmistakable as the men of this city demand that the Levite be brought out, that he might know him. 
which is just purely a sexual act of aggression against him. One might be tempted, Peter Williams says, one might be tempted to read no innocently, but they want to get to know the stranger in their midst. But the context and the subsequent horror don't allow us to dwell on that possibility for very long at all. The men of the Israelite city are wanting the man to be brought out for sex with them just as the men of the most proverbial proverbial wicked non-Israelite city, that's Sodom, wanted to have sex with Lot's guests. But the parallels run even deeper because the host in both goes out to say, my brothers don't do bad. Did you notice that? It happens in Genesis 19. It happens in Judges 19. Lot offers his virgin daughters to protect his male guests. Here the old man offers his virgin daughter and his concubine. And worse than Lot, he invites them to not just to rape them, but to humiliate them. Do what is good in your own eyes. Did you see that? In chapter 19, verse 24. And this echoes what I was saying is this big theme in this part of the book extraordinarily we hear him say but to this man do not do this foolish thing to this man don't do this foolish thing so things have come to a point where the father thinks his solidarity and his connection to a male guest trumps his parental care for his daughter how do you get there I said this when I was talking about Genesis 19 I am the father of four daughters Uh, somebody comes to my door and they want to harm my daughters, they will only do it over on my dead body. That is not the way that this father responded. Here you go. The Levite grabs a hold of the concubine, thrusts her out, sparing us details, thankfully. The The narrator just says, they knew her and abused her all night until morning. And when the day began to break, they let her go. Um, as I read this part, I, I can't help, if you're, if you're reading slowly, you cannot help but think, what in the world did she endure that night? What did she endure? The woman came as the day was dawning, fell down at the door of the man's house where her master was till it was light. She collapses while her master, um, and by the way, doesn't the title say a lot about, the, about that relationship, her master? He's safe inside. The narrator, by the way, is trying to show us something about our own heart and the way that we we react to this story. He shocks us with the callousness of what is happening here, and rightly so. And if you think of the next verse, when her master arose in the morning, probably after a good night's sleep, I mean, he sends her out and he goes to sleep. What is the matter with this person? And he opens the door of the house, which she had been shut out from. And he goes on his way like business as usual. And there was his concubine, verse 27 read, remember? Fallen at the door of the house with her hands on the threshold. The position of her hands, and I just want to quote Peter Williams here because he said it better than I ever could. The position of her hands so close and yet so far shows exactly where the narrator's sympathies lie. And it's in the personal tragedy of that poor woman. But the callousness of the Levite shocks even further. And he said to her, get up, let's go. And he took her on the donkey and the man arose and he went to his place. What, how are we supposed to respond to a passage like this? I mean, on the one hand, I think we're supposed to be shocked. Don't you? But again, as I said before, this passage is descriptive. It's not prescriptive. Uh, What you find a lot of times is is that God works. It's not that what God is, is that it doesn't say that God has a lesser view of women. Instead, what you find is the way that that culture views women. That's what you learn. We have to observe the heartlessness of the Levite who thrust out his concubine to the predators. You have to. Uh, Expected her to simply resume travel in the morning. Are you kidding me? And then when she doesn't, he dismembers her body. We also notice that the death through, uh, well, excuse me. It, 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 I, let me skip that part. I'm going to get to that here in a second. It is unusual that the story never relates the concubine's death. Did you notice that? She's just there. She's not moving. It never relates that. We don't know when she died because the heartless Levite never checked. What some Old Testament scholars have said is, I just hope it was before he cut her up. 
But we actually don't have anything in the text that confirms that or promises that. We put on the donkey half dead, like the man in Jesus' story of the Good Samaritan. You remember? Beaten literally to right next to death and left there. And then thrown over a donkey and carried right on the steps of death away. Was, was she there? We're actually not sure. The Levite just says, get up. If you move through the rest of the story, and I'm going to do this a little bit more quickly, what, what results? In chapter 20, civil war breaks out. 11 tribes versus one tribe. It's 11 tribes versus the tribe of Benjamin. War breaks out. The tribe, by the way, of the aggressors from Gibeah. Even here, the good side is not good when you think about it because it's following a Levite's false report of what happens. He even misleads people about what happens and happened to this woman. So when you think about it, of Israel, one-tenth of Israel is lost as a result. Almost all of the tribe of Benjamin is lost as a result. The whole narrative is reminiscent of Israel's attack um, on, on Ai, Ai, some would say, Ai, before. In other words, an Israelite city has become as bad as the Canaanites. And so all of Benjamin are kept are killed except for 600 men. Now this is, this is where I want to turn. I just want to put a few points up here for you that I, hope, that I hope help if those are available. Feel free to take a picture of it. You can write these down uh, because there's something that I want you to get from this story. Because when you think about it, you got the way that this book ends. Uh, you have a problem. The Israelites had made a stupid vow not to allow their daughters to marry men from Benjamin. Benjamin. And so the solution, destroy all of Jabesh Gilead except for 400 virgins. Uh, this creates a strong bond between the small tribe of Benjamin and Jabesh Gilead so that Saul is quick to come to their aid in 1 Samuel 11. Uh, still 200 wives short, Israelites decide that if the Benjaminites ambush and abduct 200 dancing girls in Shiloh, that's all right. We're still short on women. So if you can just go get 200 more, that would be amazing. And that's how the book ends. That's how it ends. Solution to the problem of male violence equals abducting more women. That's how it ends. They have learned absolutely nothing. And the last line of the book, which I mentioned before, I'm just going to repeat. In those days, there was no king in Israel. And everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So this story is a story without a hero. Did you catch that? If you look at the rest of Judges, you see some really broken people but they're heroes. They're flaws. They have flaws, but God does amazing things through them. Every one of them, not here. No character is named. These characters evoke us. The Bible, by the way, is not tone deaf to the problem of male violence against women. And when somebody asks me, as um, you know, Richard Dawkins, the, the famous atheist, really has problems with passages like this, well, yeah, but so do I. But the problem I have isn't the problem that he's got. When we ask a question like, why would a narrative like this be included in a Bible that is supposed to be holy? The answer is, and I think you have three points here that are worth keeping. And I'm borrowing these totally from David Lamb, an Old Testament scholar. I think they're worth, I think they're worth keeping. Here's the first. We need to remember the text states that the rapists themselves are worthless. Did you catch that when you read it? How are they described? They're described as worthless. So if you want some idea on how it is that God views these people, that's a pretty good idea. Second, their actions are described as wicked and vile and outrageous. So even though on the one hand, and this is if you read all of chapters 19 through 21, right? So on the one hand, we would love to have that verse that just kind of inserts itself when the, the horror is happening and says, and this is wrong, but it's not there. But instead you find as you read the narrative, God is condemning it all along the way. And then third, you saw this at the end, their city, Gibeah, was compared to another city. It was compared to Sodom, a city that was so wicked that it was destroyed. Now, ultimately, I want to say this about Gibeah. Gibeah is destroyed because a civil war breaks out that was prompted by this crime, which is why I was threading you through Judges chapter 20 and 21. So for me, I just say, okay, Is there the verse where God says, and thus I condemneth this? Not so much like that. 
Instead, you find it as you continue to read the narrative and the way that judgment fell on the people for the evil that inhabited not just the actions here, but the hearts of them that could have produced an action like this. So hopefully this helps a little bit. How does God view women? I wanna be very clear. This passage gives no one a license to say that God views women as basically property to be used by men the way that men want to use them. Instead, what you see is the exact opposite. You see what men do, and then you see God bring down judgment on them for what they've done. That, I think, is probably the best rendering of understanding the heart of God, even in a passage as difficult as this. Now, that's where I want to stop my comments for tonight. You probably have some questions. If you don't, what I invite you to do, and Matthew's going to join me up here, uh, but what I would invite you to do is you get your phone out, go to menti.com, and uh, even as we are answering uh, some of the questions, if you have another question, you feel free to type that in. And what we'll do is we'll get to that as, as quickly as we can. Or if we just run out of time, then, you know, it is what it is. Here's the good news. You know where I live, right? And so I'm going to invite Matthew to come up, join me. And while he's coming, I do want to say this. Um, next week, uh, we're going to be looking at the obliteration of Sennacherib's army. And so what you're going to find is 185,000 people are going to get wiped out in an evening. That's pretty good bloodshed, right? And it all comes from an angel, of, uh, an angel of death that is appointed by God to do that. So on the one hand, we look at a passage like the rape of the concubine and we go, God wasn't telling anybody to be doing this to these women. You go, right. Um, God seemed to be saying to do that uh, when it comes to Sennacherib and his army. And so this becomes the problem of divine violence. And how do we make sense of that. So that's what's coming next week. After that, I just need to let you know, uh, we're going to take a break from Veritas. And the reason we're going to do that is because I have about 70 of our church members that I'm leading on a study trip uh, as we're going and we're starting in Rome and we're going to be going uh, through Rome and parts of Italy, kind of a footsteps of Paul trip going into Greece and then we're going up to Israel. And so I can't be in two places at the same time. So you all get a break right? Uh, but as soon as we come back from, uh, from the trip, Veritas is back on, all right? So let's go to your questions. I'm sure that there, is there one, Matthew? There's one. There's one? There's one. Only yeah, one? Yeah, it's really weird. Yeah, I thought there'd be a wow. whole more. Wow, okay. No, I may have done. There's you, several, no, actually. Man, yeah, I'm sorry. All right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he gave me this hope, yeah, you know? Yeah, sorry. That, no, it's all right. This is We're both this wearing is gray. We're both wearing gray tonight, and I hope they can see us. I, you're wearing sure. blue. This is gray. All right, we'll, we'll deal with that later. <laughs> so, all right, so what's the first question? Oh, there's, okay. Um, so this is a reference to that quote related to uh, they did not have a king and they were doing everything in their right, but they wanted to in their own eyes. Right. right? So uh, does, this, does this lead to that unthinkable uh, depravity? I mean, is it showing what that leads to? Yeah, I, we need to be careful there, right? Uh, because... We need to, if you take the whole narrative of scripture and you say, well, if they'd only had a king, right? Mm -hmm. I, I want to avoid that uh, right. because I would, I would say the problem wasn't primarily that they lacked a king. The problem is, is what is the condition of your heart that could do this to someone? Um, and that's not something that government might can help, but government is probably not going to solve that problem. That's something that only, that only God can do. Mm -hmm. And that's why I said, you know, if you look at this story and you look even over into the New Testament, you know, she is from Bethlehem. Jesus is from Bethlehem, right? right? Ultimately, she dies and ultimately Jesus dies, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think I want to I thread that a little bit more closely. But there are also times where you have kings that are not worth a flip in the Old Testament as well. So just having a king is insufficient. And that's also why I was saying, look at this. In Judges, you have basically as little government as you could possibly ask for. And everybody's doing evil, uh, what's right in their own eyes. If you look over at kings, you've got a lot of government. And guess what? You have a lot of problems with people. Right. So uh, I just want to keep that clear. Good leadership is good, right? Power is not necessarily bad. Uh, good, good use of power is good. It's that the problem is located somewhere else. Right. Does that answer the, because you're talking about the problem of depravity. Yeah, we're, I think we're getting there. Yeah. So we know based on the history of Israel, they, they did not want God to be their king. Right. They wanted their own king. And so we get to this right. process of going through this, right? And so as that happens, we, we end up with judges that aren't great, 
They kind of go downhill as they go. And then we look to a kings, and we have some good kings up front, but they kind of right. up and down. Right. So to, to your point, that depravity just continues on because they've, they've turned from God, I think, is what we're... Ultimately, isn't this what that's pointing to? They've turned from God. Well, even look at the, look at the good ones, right? I mean, most people would, would, would take David, right. right? And they would talk about the expansion of, uh, you know, you talk about a unified kingdom, which mm-hmm. is good. The expansion of the kingdom, which is good. Uh, you talk about the defeat of a lot of oppressor nations, which on the face of it seems to be good. But then you look at the life of David and you go, right. And this guy was, oh, let's see, he was... He was an adulterer. David Lamb, who I was quoting earlier, uh, doesn't think that he just committed adultery with Bathsheba. He thinks that he raped her. Right. And, in virt- and, and, and largely because of his position as the king, she didn't have a way to say no to him. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to go down that road, but I'm just saying that would make it even worse if that's true. So he commits adultery. He has her husband murdered. And then if you look at 1 Samuel, the way that it describes David, he doesn't even really care about it for a year. Uh, right? And mm-hmm. so uh, just, just absolutely like unyielding, self-justifying, you know, and that's one of the kings. And kings were also supposed to be spiritual leaders for the people. Uh, they had a responsibility. Then you go to Solomon. Well, I mean, what do you say about that? First Kings 3, mm-hmm. you know, be, be careful, right? Many, you know, women will turn your heart. First Kings 11, and many women turn the heart of Solomon. Well, it was, there are these themes that go right. through that there are spiritual themes that uh, even when we look at the quote unquote good ones, uh, if you look in the wisdom literature, uh, depending on how you look at, at, at Ecclesiastes, you know, did Solomon write it? Did he not? Who cares? I, I, think, I think at the end of the day, it's, if, it, if he didn't write it, it's about him. And you have this, you have this story. I'm convinced of that. Well, yeah, I'm teaching the class He's right now. He's the archetype so I, I, for could, it, right? We could, we could and imagine him, him, imagine yeah. him being this mm-hmm. old man wa- mm-hmm. walking out on, his, on the palace and looking out and saying, I've expanded a kingdom that was right. even greater than my father. Mm-hmm. And the way that he describes it, or the way that it's described is, is, is and this is, this is vain. All of this is empty. Right. Some of that you can't help but think, whether he wrote it, whether it's a, a, of him or about him, uh, Solomon that is, I think the thing to keep in mind is, is, is they're totally aware of the expense that, that, that came with this. Right. So a lot was accomplished, but at what spiritual expense? And the answer is, is quite a lot, quite a lot. No, it's significant. It's significant. Yeah, so, yes, yeah. but it's a good question. That, no, I think it is a good question because we have to think about that now. With I think if you, you could try to compare that to today, and if someone would want to say the depravity of our government or the depravity of our people and how we do things, is that leading to a similar sort of? And sometimes it seems like well, our questions go that way, as in, yeah. are we mirroring what you saw going on? Down yeah, there? Well, that, well, that question was even asked last week. Right. You know, do you ever yeah. think that America could get, could get to a place, you know, where God could judge, could judge kind of a, just not individuals, but a country or a nation? And I'm sitting there going, well, I've read the Bible, and it seems, yes, mm-hmm. <laughs> absolutely. There's a, I, I don't see God, for all the times that God judges the Canaanites, and you know, every, everybody was here like, oh, what about the Canaanites? Uh, God judges the Israelites as quickly as he does the Canaanites. You know, every time the Israelites walk away from him in the covenant, guess what happens? Right. You know, they get handed over to somebody, the Babylonians or the Assyrians or, or some, somebody like that. What would keep me from saying that God couldn't do that to the United States? far as I can tell, nothing. Or just, just, you could argue any country for that matter. Anybody. Yeah. yeah. Right. I mean, it's just, I, I, this is where I live. So, right. No, yeah. So everybody's worried about what God does with the United States because we're living in it, right? right. Uh, or Texas being its own country. Or Texas, yeah, it's Texas, Texas since we're our own country. Right. <laughs> That's right. So uh, these are a few more detailed questions kind of work out here. Uh, why did he send out the body parts of the concubine? Why did, why did that happen in the first place? Yeah, well, notice that in the narrative when it says that he, he dissected her and he sends her out, you know, why do something like that? Um, that's a question that has kind of plagued me here. Uh, to me, I've never been satisfied with an answer. Uh, so if there's an unsatisfying answer for you. I don't have an, an, an answer. Even after reading Old Testament scholars on this passage, I'm sitting there going, I, none of this is making me... Uh, content. What we, what we do know is, you know, that if something is going out to the 12 tribes, there's something symbolic about the act. Right. Right. Uh, and, and so, you know, one of the things, one of the things that was recommended or, or not was suggested, not recommended, but one of the things that was suggested 
is that this act that was done to her, this was supposed to be symbolic to any other concubine that would act accordingly. This mm-hmm. is what happens yeah, to you. That. And so that tends to be the, the kind of the major rendering of why an act like that would happen. So has happened to her is what will happen to you. Um, is that true? I, I don't know. There, there's your main... There's your main response. Yeah, I was, I was doing a little more reading on this too, and I didn't see anything that was what you'd refer to as satisfying because yeah. it's so beyond our comprehension about why that would even happen. Yeah, it's beyond the pale. Yeah. I mean, what if, I, I get it, Old Testament scholars would be like, yeah, so it's probably symbolic, right? Sending the body mm-hmm. parts out, and it's like, whatever happened to her is what will happen to you, so be ye warned, concubines, right? Uh, the message has been sent. Or maybe the guy just did it. Right. <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. there, and, and, I mean, the whole point, you look at this guy and you say, what condition would his heart be in that he could do something like this to her? Not just the sending her out, but it's described of him explicitly in the passage. It's not just that he commissioned her gang rape. It's that he commissioned her utter humiliation. And so what would bring that to its completion to me would be... Well, I've always been curious about when they... When she left him, it's more of a wife situation. I know it's secondary. Second talking, tier, but second sure, tier, but yeah, yeah, absolutely. He was referred to as a husband later as a master slash lord. Right. So she was gone for three months, and then he goes and, you know, has a big party with her father-in-law, comes and goes, tries to leave, tries to leave. So you wonder if there's some sort of dynamic in that relationship. I know this is probably playing way too much into it. That <laughs> leads to this eventual point of... It's, it's hard to even comprehend that level of not liking somebody to do that. But Yeah, but it's hard so. to comprehend the whole story, isn't well, yeah, it? I mean, it is. you read the story mm-hmm. and you go, what in the world? I mean, and then you reread it and you go, still, what in the world? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I've been more inclined to, and I try to make this point. Notice that she, you know, he's referenced as the master, even though a concubine, I try to be very clear, is a second tier wife. Mm-hmm. Did you all hear me say that? A concubine is a second tier wife. And yet, how was he referred to? He was referred to as the master. And that's why I was saying there's something in the language in the passage that tells you something about this guy, right? right? Because it isn't always that way with concubines and their husband, which is the way right. that it was really supposed to be viewed. I'm not endorsing it, by the way. Um, you know, David Lamb, who uh, my wife's out there going, that's good, that's good. I'm not, <laughs> you know, uh, what darkness lurks in the Evans home, right? Uh, I'm not endorsing any of this. There's nothing in scripture that endorses polygamy, nothing at all. But what it does do is it describes it as a, as a fact in the ancient Near East, right? So there's that. And I think it's similar to this story. All the, the language I think is there and it's on purpose. Why is he referred to as the master? It says something about him. There are other times where even with Solomon is, you know, has his concubines, but is not referred to as a master. Right. Even though, by the way, he's a king. You see a difference? Mm-hmm. So to me, it's more about him than it is anything else. Why did he, why does the story include that? Is because he did it. That's why it includes it. That's why it includes it. Right. So you could say that there's not even more detail you could even add to that. I mean, the symbolism could be there, but it may not be there. The symbolism could be it. there, but it may not be there. It might be, why is it there? It's because it's what he did. Right. It's because it's what he did. Right. I think, and go ahead. I also want to say this. Yeah. We, uh, part, of, part of the thing that came over me this week as I was reading this passage is, uh, you know, if, if you, if, <laughs> we might have lost some of our sensitivity to some of this stuff. Is that fair? Is that fair? We, we might have lost some of our sensitivity to this stuff because we are so inundated with it Violence against women. You're seeing it all the time. Uh, you, don't, you don't have to go back to the time of the Bible to see women treated like they are not created in the image of God and are equally valuable to men. You can go to certain parts of the world right now and you can have the same experience, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and scripture is trying to say something to us. And I think the reason that scripture is so vivid in Judges chapter 19, as well as Genesis 19 with Lot and his daughters, right? We... If we're not careful in our churches, we will so sanitize the Bible, it's not the Bible anymore. And we, w- we don't want to speak to the things that the Bible's trying to speak to because it's hard to speak to them. It's hard to speak to them. For me, I'm just like, hey, let the Bible speak. And I think the language is as graphic as it is because I think God wants to shock our conscience because we're just too comfortable with it. 
We're just too comfortable with it. And moreover, we try to find ways, just like happens in these stories, where we justify it. And God's voice is still heard. No matter how we spin it, it is despicable and wicked, and God's voice still gets heard. Yeah. All right. A uh, few more questions related to our husband slash master. Uh, so he, he chops her into little pieces, or the 12 pieces that we know of. As a Levite, he was a priest. We would understand that maybe not a good one. Yeah, we uh, can go with that. So <laughs> we don't see any suffering of consequences for him. Why, why is that, do you think? Yeah, we don't know. Um, yeah, it's, they just don't see Yeah, it. I mean, part of the consequence, that's why I said on your own time, go read the rest of the narrative, right? So read chapter 20 and 21. And that's why I said, what is the result of this? Well, civil war breaks out. The idea that there's no consequences to him, I think, is an overstatement. Well, you, we don't know. We, well, we don't, I, I yeah. think what, if, if what you're saying is, is nothing, you know, he didn't experience any hardship because of this, right. I, we don't know. You, right. So you can't say that. Given that his country falls apart and Judges 19 is a large reason why you see this civil war and conflict among their own people mm -hmm. and you see basically a nation implode, well, he did somewhat inherit the, the consequences of the choices that he made. Right. I think, I think maybe the heart of the, the, the thing is, is, and why didn't God just render a judgment directly on him, right, uh, such that immediately he starts to suffer like this slow and painful death, right? All of a sudden he has these sores all over his body, right? Uh, and they just don't seem to go away. And then all of a sudden he finds out he has this horrible disease, but he's gonna, it's going to linger with him for a long time. And some, some of you are probably, how many of you thought that? Don't lie to me, right? Um, you said, you're like, yeah, that just seems like that would be great for him. Right. Is that, does that seem fair? A lot of you at least kind of feel that way. No, 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 no God, just kind of drag this out for this guy. I, I, I think that, that there's something we want to keep in mind, though. In all of these stories where you see sin on its, on display, and I mean the fullness of display, we need to be very careful with a reaction like that. And the reason that I say that, not to say that there aren't consequences to his choices, because obviously there are, that's the rest of the story. But I don't know about you, but I am thankful for the patience and the mercy and the grace of God. I'm thankful for it. And that is a narrative that is threaded all the way throughout the Bible, including our friends, the Canaanites, where God gives them four generations to repent and to turn, only after four generations to say, I've given you the time that was needed and now there's judgment. God ultimately gets to the judgment. God will. Uh, but I always kind of hold back and I say, why? Why so kind to some of these people? And the answer is, is what did he create them for? Mm -hmm. And the answer is the same thing he created me and you for, and that's to know him and to enjoy him. So, so I always temper some things. Right. Because ultimately, at the end... Uh, Ecclesiastes, which I know you might want to debate me on the Solomon point, okay. and that would be a fun debate be fun. that we're not going to do for you tonight. <laughs> that might be for another night. But did you notice, if you read to the end of Ecclesiastes, mm -hmm. wait, how does Ecclesiastes end? You know, the sum of the matter yeah. is this, yeah. is, to, is to know the commands of God and to obey them, mm -hmm. right? That's it. And through that, there's blessing, right? So by following what he says, there is blessing. Well, what about what happens when you don't? And the answer is, yeah, there's not any blessing there, right? So judgment is coming. It's going to happen. Do I think that guy got away with anything? Um, no. Even if the story doesn't explicitly say what happened to him, we know the way that God works. Yeah. It probably didn't end in a motion, major motion picture, you know, death, <laughs> like you're trying to describe. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. yeah. There is that judgment, just like you say in Ecclesiastes. We all face a judgment via, you know, if we're wise or if we're foolish. We're going to find judgment at the end of the time. Yeah, it's going to happen. And by the way, I let a little bit out about myself when I was saying, how many of you thought, I would love to see this guy get like sores all over his skin, this disease that's long suffering. And all. You know why I said that? It's because I have felt that way when I've read this scenario. You know what I wish happened to this guy? Mm -hmm. But then I kind of have to pump the brakes a little bit and say, you know what I really would wish for this guy is that he would have found God. That's what I really wish. So there's, there's a piece of this that I've, I've seen that during the time of the judges, well, first of all, when, before the judges, when they were in, when they went into the promised land, they were supposed to get rid of the Canaanites. Right. Instead, they turned into the Canaanites. And we kind of see that through judges. And I've seen some people use that parallel that the people of Israel have become as depraved as what 
the Canaanites were. Is that something that you've seen through this? Or? Well, yeah, and I mentioned that when I was saying, talking about Judges 19. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the problem of the city, when the city is talked about here, even though this was supposed to be a place that was set aside, these are people of Israel, right? And, it, and the way that they're described is they had become as evil as the Canaanites. Mm -hmm. Well, that's supposed, to, that's supposed to evoke something from them especially an Israelite, right? I mean, if, if you're being compared to a Canaanite you're, and you're an Israelite, you should be sitting there going, well, that's not good. That's bad. And yet there it is, a part of the story. What, what is the difference between you and them? Right. Uh, not much. Not much if this is what's going on. Right. Not much. So a, a detailed question related to, uh, in 19, you have the, uh, the roustabouts or the worthless men of Gibeah. But then later on, there are, the Levite refers to them as the leaders of Gibeah. What's, what's going on there, you think? Can't you have a worthless leader? You could. I'm just saying it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't <laughs> seem good. Yeah, I mean, think connect. about it. If, yeah. if, if you go back into Leviticus uh, you know, and you talk about, you talk about high priests, where are they supposed to be? <laughs> and I discussed this this morning a little bit. You know, high priests were supposed to be physically fit for the job, but they were supposed to be holy and pure right? Uh, do you have any instances where a person is supposed to be that, but they're not? Oh my gosh, that's the Bible. That's pretty much everybody in the Bible, right? right. So yeah, can you have a, a place of high authority and responsibility and simultaneously not be, so to speak, fit for the job? And the answer is, of course, you can have people that are given a position and yet they're sorry leaders. Mm -hmm. Of course you can. Uh, Saul was given as the first king. How good of a king was he? Well, he started okay. Let's don't beat him up too bad, right? Uh, but how long did it take for him to become, well, not that great? Mm, not very long, right? Not very long. He was given a position of authority and responsibility, and he blew it. So uh, you, you think they, I, I took it more as, and I've seen it as more of, he was trying to kind of inflate the story a little bit to make him not look as bad. And that's a possibility. That, I was just saying there's yeah. no contradiction. Right. I just, I'm just curious that maybe that's one of those things where you're reading more into it than what it needs to be. Because right. you wonder what the difference was, you know, the men of Gibeah, are they just, or the Levite man, is he just as guilty as the men of Gibeah? Right. And then is he trying to overplay this a little bit? Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, fair enough. I was just yeah. trying to say there's no contradiction there. Right. Right. I just wanted to argue with you. Yeah. yeah right. Thank you for that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we, we may have answered this, but or you may have answered this. Uh, God's views towards concubines in general, and was this an accepted cultural practice to throw your concubine out into the, to the wolves, literally? Was it an accepted concubine practice? The, an, uh, the answer is no. For the well, well, yeah. for people so, of Gibeah, or just, yeah. Right, yeah. Okay, so anytime you're dealing with, um, anytime you're dealing with, Anytime you're dealing with, with difficult passages in the Old Testament, for example, look at all the patriarchs. It's, they all had a lot of women. Have you noticed that? Abraham had a, a lot of women. David had a lot of women. Solomon had like a lot of women, right? You do the math. I mean, that's like a thousand women. Go on the current calendar. He could look at like a different woman for almost three years and not right. see the same face. That's just crazy to me, right? Uh, but that's Solomon. That's a lot of women. Um, it's descriptive, not prescriptive. The prescription you find in Genesis chapter 2, that's where it's at. So what you find is that God creates the institution, what a covenant between a man and a woman looks like in the way that he took this man and this woman and, and, and when he brought them together. Every other relationship is to model that relationship. That's why it's there. So anything that deviates from it is a deviation from God's plan, every single instance. So... Uh, so you start from Genesis 2 and you work your way out and you go, man, what about all those, what about all those multiple wives, polygamy? And you go, exactly, it deviates from Genesis 2. And so it deviated from God's plan. What about all those concubines? Exactly. It deviated from Genesis 2. And so it deviates from God's plan. What it does tell us is something about that culture though, doesn't it? It doesn't tell us how God views women. It tells us how that culture views women. And what you see is in Genesis 2, if this is what God has done in the way that he institutes a covenant between a man and a woman, and the way that he views a marriage between a man and a woman, doesn't that also tell you what God sees in a woman? And, and I've mentioned this before, and it was in a discussion to a previous question in Exodus chapter 21, verses 10 and 11. And it says this, even if you take a slave as a spouse, even if, right? It's not saying, by the way, totally endorse slavery there. Slaves were there. 
right? Even if you take a slave as a spouse, you're to give them food, clothing, and marital rights. I'm just telling you, what you find in Exodus 21, 10, and 11 was unheard of in the ancient Near East. No slave was given those prerogatives. They were treated as second-class citizens. They were property, perpetually property. And instead, God says, no, this is who they are. All along the way, you see this contrast between society and their practices and God and his view of people. So we want to keep those things clear. You start mm-hmm. with what's clear, and that's why I said always go back to the norm, and that's Genesis 2. Work your way out from there. Any deviation, and you know that they have deviated from the will of God, period, period. And then you usually also see the result of it, don't you? Many women turn the hearts of Solomon, right? David, how'd that work for him? Not well. Not well. No. I'm, just, <laughs> I'm just saying, right? Uh, you know, anything that comes from the, the womb of this woman will be a curse to you. And everything that came from the womb of that woman brought basically grief onto their home, right? Um, it was, it, it just is what it is. What if they had just said, I'm going to do it God's way? What if they had just stayed there? Not practiced what, what the culture practices, but they just said, I'm going to do this God's way. I can't help but think that the rest of Scripture for David, Solomon, and then pick your favorite people, would have read differently. It would have just been different. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying there would have been hardship. There would be. But it wouldn't be because they're shooting themselves in the foot all the time. Right. That's the difference. Yeah. So based on all this evil and judges, so I'll take you back to the fourth century when this was all put together, third, fourth century. Where, where is this going as regards to there's got to be some sort of level of hope in here that God's trying to show these people. <laughs> Not at the end of Judges, <laughs> right? I mean, well, that's why I said, it's pointing you, to something. You get, yeah, I mean, you yeah. get to the end of the book and yeah. you go, there's got to be more, right? Uh, and that last verse mm-hmm. is, is pretty indicative of the way that that part of the story ends. It's not the end of the story, it's the end of that part of the story. The answer is yes. And that's why I was quoting Peter Williams because with Peter Williams, so I said, I think that he was pointing out something that was so incredible. All of, these, these, the, all of this narrative with this woman and all the consistency that she have, has with her birthplace and everything else to Jesus, and she dies at the threshold, Jesus dies, right? Mm-hmm. And you say, what is it that is going on in this story? It's, I'm not saying it's only symbolic, but there's symbolism there. Right. There is symbolism there. Because what was true of her, what, do, what, does, what does the guy do? The guy will throw someone out to death just like we throw Jesus out to death. The same thing is true of her, is true of Jesus. She's from Bethlehem, he's from Bethlehem. Cast out and not cared for. Jesus is cast out and not cared for. The result is, is the viciousness that's out there in the world that's acted against her. The viciousness that's out there in the world that's acted against him. And yet there's the rest of the story. And the rest of the story that you find in Jesus, because Jesus could have said, and this is done right? He even said, I could call down the angels and the story is over, except the story was that he was accomplishing something through his death. And this is the thing, you know, there's this question, not just about the, not just about the concubine, but the, the, even Jesus, Mm -hmm. why does he have to die? Why does he have to die? And this is what I was visiting with a rabbi in Jerusalem. So this was fun. This was in 2007. And, um, he asked me this question. By the way, he made my wife a really beautiful cross um, necklace. It's beautiful. And as he and I were talking, he said, I don't see any reason why somebody has to die for sin. You know, why can't my love for God just be enough? Maybe you've asked the same question, and especially as I'm threading this story between Judges 19 and the death of Jesus. And here's the thing, Uh, what you find in the cross is where you find love and justice met. Not just the love of God is meted out, but the justice of God is meted out as well. That's the beauty of the cross, right? And so when Paul says the wages of sin is death, the rest of it is but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Mm -hmm. Christ, right? And that's why all of this language, for those of you that are accountants, all of that language is accounting language. 
So when we use the idea of a debt has been paid, it's all accounting language, every bit of it. It's judicial and it's accounting. It's been paid, right? The debt death has been paid once and for all. This is the beauty of Hebrews, right? Uh, so why does Jesus have to die? Is because the, the demands of the justice of God are met. It's more than that, but it includes that. Right. Right? A lot of connections on Judges 19 and that, I'm just saying. No, there are. There There's are. a lot. So do, um, again, going back to the order, I know that our order and say the Masoretic text and original Hebrew is, is not in the same order, but ours is in right. a specific order. Ruth comes immediately after right. Judges, right? Right. There's a lot more. I mean, that is Judges the pointing towards Ruth. Yeah, the kinsman redeemer is the theme if of you, Ruth. It, if you're right? if it, taking what you're saying about the parallels between Jesus and the concubine is and Ruth and what her role is as it goes right. up into Jesus, I mean, is that something that you see as a natural? No, the answer to that is yes. Uh, you know, the reason why, as I was saying before, if you look at it, Bethlehem just keeps coming up in this section of Scripture, mm -hmm. right? It's not just in Judges. It's in the books that are following as well. Bethlehem keeps coming up. And you go, why does it keep coming up? Because it's pointing to something that's going to happen in Bethlehem that is the game changer, right? right? It's the game changer. And that's why I was trying to bring in Jesus the way mm -hmm. that I was. Born of Bethlehem. There's always... Does that make sense? Yeah. So yeah, all, all of it matters. And then you look at the genealogy of Jesus, right? Go over into the New Testament and you're going to get this thread that goes through Ruth and right. Boaz and so forth. All of this connects. Yeah, I was trying to get a little bit of hope in here before we stop tonight. No, I was I, I'm giving hope, right? I was writing the rest downer, of the yeah. story, yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, I tried to give hope when I said, hey, oh, yeah, as absolutely. despicable as this guy yes. is, and mm -hmm. I'm saying they're wanting to him get, not just get canker sores. I'm wanting him to get like real stuff, you know? And I have to pump the brakes and say, right. you know what? You know what I really want him to get? I want him to get God. Mm -hmm. That's what I want him to get. Um, I would hope that's what you would want him to get to. Yeah. We're out of time. Why are we? We are. Wow. Tonight was fun. It was fun. Yeah. You know, the, the thing about, hopefully tonight helped a little bit. Did it? At least a little bit. You know, we're, we're, we're doing, we're, <laughs> we're not going into easy passages. What can I say? These are tough. And I'm going to try to be fair to these passages. There are times where I'm just going to say, you know what? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, just like with, with, with your question before, mm -hmm. and why cut her up into 12 pieces and send, send them to the 12 tribes and so forth? You know what? It's because it's what he did. That, that's the place that I've settled, and I've just kind of left it there. I didn't go with the other Old Testament scholars who are like, well, you know. I didn't, I didn't go. It's because it's what he did. He did it, right? But I also want us to see this. One of the reasons that I am so appreciative for the Bible is because especially in a time where we don't want to see sin as sin, like we don't want to, the Bible makes us see it. You, you can't not, if Richard Dawkins, the famous atheist, is looking at passages like this and going, what in the world? I'm saying they're going, I think the Bible just did its job. Even you are seeing it and can't deny it. The world is broken and it needs to be put back together. That, of course, is the rest of the story. But you don't get to the need for Jesus if you don't get there. If you don't see the brokenness first. You don't see the mess. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get there. You're not going to see the need for it. I don't think Richard Dawkins is look, would look at a story like this or just what happens in the world right now and say, I think the world's exactly as it ought to be. And by the way, he doesn't say that. He thinks the world is a mess. I agree with him. The question isn't, is it a mess? The question is, what's the solution? He doesn't have one. I do. So there's hope. Right. We'll end on that. How That's does that good. sound? I like it. Yeah, That's I like a good it. way to end tonight. So.